Good morning, ladies. How are you this morning? We good? Okay, so as we get started this morning, guess what? We have crossed the halfway mark in Nehemiah, so that's pretty cool. And as we finished up last week, remember he simply stated that the walls were complete. Um, remember, no fanfare, no fireworks, nothing. Um, but I bet that none of their advers adversaries saw that coming, that they would have completed that wall in 52 days. And it says that it caused those nations around them to be fearful because they realized that it was God who did it, the God of heaven, uh, who was their great and awesome God. Now, the opposition of greed um, that came from the wealthier Jews towards the poorer Jews. And then, of course, the character assassination of Nehemiah, just lots of opposition for him. It did not defeat them and allow that wall to be, um, not to be completed. And we remember too that when the enemy can't defeat us in one area, what will he do? He'll often strike us in another area. But what these enemies didn't realize is that they had the God of heaven on their side, so they had all that they needed, and they had a wonderful, godly, um, organized, strategic leader in Nehemiah. So let me pray before we get started this morning, and then we will dive into this study. Hmm. Lord, I just come before you this morning, and I ask, Father, it's been a crazy morning for me, probably for some other women in this group too. So Father, I just ask that you would allow the things of this world to fall away so that we can put our focus on you. Lord, I pray, um, well, I praise you for your word and all the things that you're teaching us through Nehemiah. I thank you for the special guest that we're gonna have today and what a blessing she's gonna bring to us today too. So Lord, we look with anticipation at what you have uh, planned for each of us this morning. Help us to walk out of here this morning applying something to our lives so Lord, that we are changed women that look more like you. In your precious name, amen. Okay, so it, as we're looking at chapter seven and eight, I thought it was interesting for one thing that they put the chapters together because it's kind of like we're straddling the fence because chapter seven is basically completing the first half of Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the wall and then chapter eight begins the second half of Nehemiah which is renewing the covenant and also reforming the nation as a whole. So up to this point, Nehemiah, he never even spoke anything about other than about rebuilding that wall. But we see that the shift is starting to happen because he's making sure that there's a prepared list of those who are living in the land listing those who were available to come back in and to live in the protected city of Jerusalem. Remember too that he, up to this point through chapter seven, he's writing in first person and we're gonna see that shift take place in chapter eight and all the way through chapter 12. So he cares about the spiritual renewal of the nation but felt at this point that it was best to pass the baton on to Ezra, because remember, he's the priest and the scribe. And if you read Ezra, you would remember or maybe know that the primary reason um, for Ezra was, or for his primary purpose was to read the law and teach it to the people of Israel. Now, Nehemiah and Ezra were contemporaries, so he passes that baton of leadership for the renewal of the nation on to Ezra. Wearsby says, what began with concern that we remember that God gave him in chapter one led to construction in chapters two and three. And then we saw lots of conflict in chapters four through six, a charge given to the people we'll see in chapter seven, and then consecration in chapters eight through 12. So first we're gonna look at, and I've gotta remember my, my duties up here. No, no. No, no, oh, we didn't have an opening slide. I don't know where it went. Okay, so what we're gonna look at in chapter seven is the list, and in chapter eight, we're gonna look at the law. So go ahead and open up your Bibles to Nehemiah. 
So we begin chapter seven with Nehemiah stating that now that the walls are built and the doors have been putting it, put in place, what is he doing? Nehemiah is setting up some structure or some order by appointing leaders. He needed to have key appointments of leaders in place so that the city would run smoothly. So he needed the gatekeepers, which those would be kind of like the police that we have during our day. Um, He needed to keep that city safe. And then he would appoint the singers, and those would be the people that would lead the worship in the temple. And then he appointed the Levites, and they would come alongside and help the priests. Remember that the Levites um, came from the tribe of Levi, just like the priests, but to be a priest, they had to come directly from Aaron's line, which was Moses' brother. Um, So then it tells us that he puts Hanani in uh, a position of authority and Hananiah, so a mouthful of both, uh, as the commander of the citadel in Jerusalem. So why did he do that? Well, he does that because they're faithful men. Even though we we see a little nepotism going on here with him putting uh, Hanani in a position of leadership, he was really the best man for the job. So how do we know that? Remember I told you back in chapter one, um, his brother Hanani was a faithful man because remember, he's the one that came to Nehemiah in the first place and he's the one that brought word to him about the condition of Jerusalem. He showed concern for the city and the welfare of the city and he was the one that was willing to make that long trip to, ne- to tell Nehemiah what was going on. And then he picked Hananiah because he was a man that exemplified integrity and he feared God more than most. So that should be something that we ask ourselves. Are we surrounding ourselves with people of integrity that fear the Lord? All right, let's look at verse three. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own homes. So he's instructing them to make sure that the gates of Jerusalem are not opened until the sun is hot and to make sure in the evening before they clock out that those gates are closed. It's likely that he waited until the sun was hot so that they could look out and they could survey the area and make sure that there are no enemies around. And it's the same reason that I don't let the dog out before the skunks go home in the morning because we've been ambushed by that enemy before. So they closed and locked the gates at night for the same reason, ladies, that we do it before we go to bed. We wanna keep intruders out. And then it says that he appointed some of the guards and these were likely some citizens that also were people of integrity that he could trust. So we've learned from Nehemiah in our studies so far what a strategic man he is. And that table, one of the tables I sat with this morning said the same thing. What a planner he was. He knew the importance of being organized and he knew the importance of having a system in place. And especially now that the city was complete and the walls and the gates were um, in place. He could, you know, at this point, Nehemiah could have said to the people, he could have shake, shaken their, shook their hands, however you say it, and said, peace out, my job is done, and I'm going home. But he didn't do that. And he didn't do it because he recognized that this is a very vulnerable time for the people. He did not want what they had spent 52 days working so diligently on to be ruined. If we don't guard what we've gained, we can lose it. So he's setting up a system of government with key people that reported to him that he could delegate to, and then he's telling them how he wants them to do things. So this is important, ladies, in our homes as well as our businesses. And it made me think of when my boys were little and they had the responsibility because they're the ones that, you know, made a mess in our van. So it was their responsibility to vacuum out our van every week, to cut the grass, to clean their bathroom. And I always told them it was kind of like cleaning the Texaco and they needed to know how to do it because I lived with all men and they needed to appreciate cleaning a bathroom. 
But I had a system in place for my kids so that they couldn't say, well, I forgot how to clean the bathroom because we had three by five index cards on the inside of the cabinet that told them exactly how to do it. And then if they couldn't remember how to set the table, they could open a cabinet in the kitchen and see what that's supposed to look like too. So I didn't leave them a whole lot of excuses. But systems are the things that keep our lives running smoothly. And they're important because what happens when we get to the finish line? We're excited, you know, I picture that Snoopy dance in my mind, I've made it, I'm done. But again, if we don't guard what we have worked so hard for, we can lose it. It's kind of like getting our finances in order and then you think, well, I've earned a little spending spree but that's not the goal. Or we've exercised and we're eating right and then we cave into the sweets. And then what about our marriages? What about when we start to neglect the little things that make our spouses feel special and appreciated? And how about our quiet time? If we don't have a system in place, chances are we won't make that a priority in our lives. So again, we need to guard what we've gained by having a system in place. In 2 John verse eight, it tells us to watch out so that we don't lose what we've worked for. So one teaching that I heard I especially loved was it talked about the people whose lives are out of order or lack structure, and they're not able to maintain what they work for or even really what they desire to have in their lives because they have no structure and they have no system. And so this acrostic was given and I thought it was very interesting because great leaders have great systems in place. So a system in place saves you stress, time, energy, and money. And when we don't have it, what happens in our lives, it makes things a little crazy. And because I'm ADHD, I love systems. It's how my life runs because without them, it gets really crazy really fast. So now that the walls are in place and things are secure, the people are ready to move back in. They're ready to start building houses and get settled and put things in order. Look with me at verse five. It tells us, that God put it on Nehemiah's heart to assemble all the people, the nobles, officials, and common people to register their families. So what he's basically doing here is he's taking a census, and because Zerubbabel uh, in Ezra chapter two recorded that very first wave of the Israelites that came back from um, that came back from exile, he had this wonderful genealogical record of them. So we see this long list of names here. So why did Zerubbabel write down all those names? Because these were the people that were willing to take that leap of faith. Those were the ones that came out of exile and Nehemiah takes that list and then he begins to prepare that list with who's gonna move back into the neighborhood. And did you notice in verse five where it says, my God, my God, put it on my heart. And to, to quote Stephen Cole, he says, you know how you know he's your God? When he's your God, he will impact your life in the deepest recesses of who you are. He begins working in your heart. You get those nudges from the Holy Spirit that direct you. So why would Nehemiah want to register these families? Why want all those genealogical records? It says that not many had rebuilt their homes. Very few were actually residing inside the city of Jerusalem. And Nehemiah wanted to populate the city with pure Jewish descent. And this list is almost identical to the one in Ezra chapter 2. Now look with me at verses um, 16. 6 to 62, again, we talked about this last week. It's kind of like tearing out that page from the Jewish phone book. Lots of names here. I thought about the one in verse 59. I think, it was, see, what was his name? Um, Pokerath Hazabam. And I thought, that poor kid. Anyway, 
So this is a record of the people that came up from captivity. So if you look at verses 63 to 69, it also tells us of a group that couldn't prove their genealogy, uh, that they were priests, so they were excluded during that time from the priesthood, and they could no longer eat the sacred food, and unless if they could come back and prove it, of course, then they could resume that role. Now look with me at verses 70 to 72. It says here that some of the families contributed to the work. Then it gives you this list of what they contributed. Uh, gold and bowls and garments and silver uh, that were donated to the treasury. And depending upon which commentary you read, they say that it's an estimation during our time of between five and $15 million. So some of the wealthier Jews, though, I would imagine they probably resented Nehemiah a little bit because remember, he's the one that took them to the task for the way that he was, they were treating the poor Jews. But obviously, some didn't because they donated so generously to the treasury. And then finally, in verse 73, it says that they begin to settle in their own homes. That means that they settled in the towns of their ancestors. So that would be like if you were from Texas, but you went back to settle in the town that your parents are from. And, you know, we know that lots of little towns in Texas are actually named after heads of uh, families. So we look over this long list of names. And, you know, it made me think about another book. And it made me think about another list. These names have nothing to do with genealogical records of the old, because the, those in the Old Testament were destroyed, but they have everything to do with those who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. As a believer, it tells us in the book of Revelation that our names are recorded in the Lamb's book of life and nobody can erase them. So let me ask you, if you had to prove your genealogy in order to get into God's city, heaven, could you? We're all headed in one direction. We're all on a destiny. It's either heaven or hell. And only those who belong to the family of God through the blood of Jesus Christ can prove their authenticity. The Jews, they cared deeply about all of these genealogical records, but you know what? God's not impressed with those. He doesn't care. What concerns him most is whether we have experienced a second birth, a rebirth. We experience rebirth when we receive Christ as our Savior. And ladies, that's when our real life begins. So the spiritual application for us that we need to know is who we belong to. We all need to know our spiritual pedigree. So look with me at chapter eight, and it, opens when it's, and it opens by saying, when the seventh month came. I'm gonna warn you, I'm going rogue here a little bit. So the first thing I wanna talk to you about is the significance of the seventh month. As God's timing would have it, all that took place before this spiritual, before this shift in spiritual renewal took place was exactly at this seventh month. In other words, they arrived at the seventh month at exactly the time they needed to. If you think about it, all the way back to when God put it on Ezra, I mean, Nehemiah's heart, and then the time he prayed about it, and then it took the time to go before Nehemiah, and then it was travel time, and then he had to build the walls. God orchestrated this so that they would arrive at the seventh month at precisely this time. And the reason it's such a big deal is the seventh month in the Jewish calendar is very significant. It's when they celebrated several feasts. Now remember, Ezra has the baton now. He's calling the people back to the Lord to be consecrated to the Lord. And to consecrate means to dedicate themselves to God, to make holy. Now, I'm jumping back and forth a little bit, but later in the chapter, it talks about the Feast of Tabernacles. But what it doesn't talk about is there's two feasts before this that are significant. There were two feasts, the first one being the Feast of Booths. No, the Feast of Trumpets, excuse me. Um, and I'm gonna briefly explain those. Let me catch up with myself. Okay, so... 
The Feast of Trumpets is on the first day of the seventh month, and it's the Jewish equivalent of, the, of New Year's Day, and it marks the beginning of the Jewish civil calendar. It's also called Rosh Hashanah, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, which means head of the year. And it marks the beginning of 10 days of consecration and repentance before the Lord. So their seventh month would correspond with about, I think your study guide said September to October-ish um, on our calendars. So it's kind of like too, it's kind of like Thanksgiving during our time. So its name comes from the command to blow trumpets in Leviticus. And the Hebrew word is terra, 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 T-E-R-U-A-H, which means a shout or a blowing. And it, it's done with a shofar, which is a ram's horn that was blown at this time. And if you remember in, I, in Nehemiah uh, 4, remember when it talked about the trumpeteer and Nehemiah told him to stay close to him? Okay, so that guy would have been the one that would have blown the shofar to regather the people in case they were attacked. Keep that in mind. So the next festival or feast, excuse me, was the Day of Atonement, which falls on the 10th day. I, re I mentioned that to you briefly last week. Remember, it's when the priest goes in once a year to the Holy of Holies, and then if he doesn't perform his duties precisely, um, they tie the rope around his ankle so that they can pull him out because they knew better than to go into the Holy of Holies. Anyway, um, this Day of Atonement points us to Christ as the sacrifice for the world. And this is a very solemn day. So then we finally come to the Feast of Tabernacles that you discuss in your lesson. And it goes from the 15th to the 21st day. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. But what I wanna point out is every Jewish feast was important because it pointed forward to Christ. And the, peace, the feasts in the seventh month were especially important. So the first feast, the Feast of Trumpets, was signaled by a blowing of a trumpet, which was a ram's horn, like I said, or called a shofar. And it was on the first day of the month, and it heralded in this solemn time of preparation in anticipation of the Day of Atonement, sometimes called 10 Days of Repentance or Days of Awe. So the trumpet sound was an alarm of sorts, and it can be understood as a call to introspection and repentance, as well as a possible day of maybe warfare if they were going to be attacked. So in the New Testament, though, we see that the Lord's second coming will be accompanied by the sound of a shofar. And it tells us that in Corinthians and Thessalonians. Also, each of the judgments that are mentioned in Revelations chapter eight and nine are signaled by a trumpet or a shofar. And just as the shofar called the Jewish nation to turn their attention to the Lord and ready themselves for the day of atonement, so will the trumpet of God call us to heaven one day and also call the world into judgment. Now, I know your table leaders emailed you about our special guest, and her name is Teresa Hudson, and I've been blessed from her, by her before from the blowing of the shofar. So in 2007, Teresa started taking classes targeted towards her curiosity of Hebraic roots, and it led her, uh, it led her to desire to learn more about the shofar and seek opportunities to share it. So the sounding of the shofar gathers and directs God's people. It has the authority to bring us to repentance, to resurrect dry and weary bones. Anybody feel dry or weary? Even brokenness. Into a refreshed and renewed mind and body and spirit. It's a powerful tool and it's used in warfare as well as in victory. So God put it on my heart to ask Teresa, and he saw fit for our schedules to work out, to come and do this for us and to remind us to consecrate ourselves to the Lord. And I thought, God's timing, it's amazing. Here we are preparing our hearts for Easter. And it's just, it's perfect timing in this lesson. 
as well as looking forward um, to, to our Easter celebration. So Teresa is going to bless us with the sounding of the shofar this morning. How many of you have ever heard a shofar? You're in for a treat. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I do have to wonder how many in the church just thought the rapture happened. <laughs> They're thinking I didn't make it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay. So let's get into chapter eight. So when the seventh month came and all the Israelites had settled in their towns, look with me at verse one. And since I can't see that screen, I sure always hope, yep, we're on the right place. It says that all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. We, the water gate we talked about, remember in chapter three, and it was where Ezra read the law and how it's um, reading the law. The word is a picture, or the water is a word, picture of the word of God. And this reminds us of the importance of being in God's word on a daily basis. And who told Ezra? Who told Ezra to bring out the book of the law? Who did? The people did, the people did. So here's a chart, if you remember from the very beginning that I showed you book of the books of the Bible. So Ezra would be reading from the Torah, which are the first, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. This was the foundation, ladies, that the Jewish people, all their religion and their civil law was based on. So these are the five books that the people would stand to hear read. And it says in verse two, so on the first day of the month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. So not only the men, but also the women were there and included. And I hope you noticed all the beautiful details that Nehemiah included in verses three through six. And I want you to do something. I want you to close your eyes and not open them till I tell you. Because what I want you to do is I want you to picture this crowd because this is between 30 and 50,000 people, if you can picture that many. So Ezra, he faces the square before the water gate in front of all these women and men. He walks up to the podium. He slowly ascends the 20 to 30 foot platform that would be above the people carrying the scroll of God's law. On his right were 13, most likely priests, that follow him up and stand beside him. He opens the book or unrolls the scroll of the law, and all eyes are on Ezra. And doubtful in this huge crowd, a word is spoken. So think of the anticipation. He unrolls the scroll, and they all begin to stand to honor the word of God. He praises God. You, God, are our great God to which the people all lift their hands and they shout, amen, amen, so be it, because they agree with Ezra. Then the people bow down with their faces to the ground to worship God. 30 to 50,000 
people with their faces to the ground, honoring God. You can open your eyes. So the people are responding to the word of God. They take a posture of worship by lifting their hands and bowing down. Their lifted hands reveal their dependence upon God and their brokenness is witnessed by the way they bow down. They are starting to see the true condition of their hearts and the sin in their lives. And I can speak for myself and maybe some of you when I say I don't give God's word the reverence that it deserves. His word is sacred and it deserves our reverence and attention. So how concerned are you about how other people worship around you? Either how you worship or how others worship around you. So it was interesting all the things that God brings across my path. And one of them was a quote by Priscilla Shire that was on Instagram. And she said, if you find yourself sitting in a worship service that isn't quite your style, rather than complain about it, look around. Notice how that style is ministering to others and rejoice. See how Jesus meets people where they are and look for ways to be part of a, a, part of a type of worship that challenges your inner critic. Sometimes we're so worried about how other people are worshiping, we're not paying attention to how we're worshiping. And how did it say that they listened attentively? And how long did they listen? From daybreak until noon, probably five to six hours they stood and listened to the word of God. And we complain when church runs over a little bit or the worship is too long at the beginning. So, Think about these Israelites that stood that long. And then verse seven tells us that the Israelites, I'm not gonna try to, or the Levites, I'm not gonna try to pronounce their names. They instructed the people while they were standing there. So verse eight says, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being said. Now, Nehemiah doesn't tell us how Ezra and the Levites were able to explain God's word in a crowd this size. Uh, maybe they did it a section at a time and maybe the Levites would circulate and answer questions and help to make it clear. I would imagine though where they were, the acoustics had to be pretty good too with this many people. So then those instructing the people say in verse nine, this day is holy to the Lord your God why am I not clicking? I'm clicking, but it's not clicking. Okay. Um, the day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. So what can we assume from their weeping? Obviously, we know that it deeply touched their heart and their emotions. They were probably convicted of sin and how do we respond to God's word, especially when it steps on our toes? Do we lean into it? Do we ask God to revive our hearts so that his will lines up with how we're living our lives or do we just brush it off? James Boyce points out four essential steps to true revival in our lives and it begins with prayer. Notice Ezra prayed before he ever even opened the word of God. So we begin with prayer and the right heart attitude. And then of course we need to read the word so that we can revive our hearts. Romans 10, 17 says, consequently faith comes from hearing the message and the message is through the word of Christ. And then of course we need the explanation of God's word and that's what the Levites were there doing, helping the people to understand what God's word said. And so we need teaching and sermons to give us understanding of God's word. And that's kind of what we're doing here. We're doing what you would call expository teaching, taking it line by line, and that's what they did as well. And then you would need sorrow over sin. That's the first indication that revival is truly on the way. If you have sorrow over your sin. Romans 3.20 says, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Now look at verse 10. It must have been pretty intense grief because it tells us in verse 10 that Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to the Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
Again, you notice Nehemiah is reminding the people to be conscious of the poor among them. And then the Levites say the same thing to the people in verse 11, go and enjoy some food and drinks. Don't grieve, this day is sacred. And I know that your lesson covered that well too. There's, there were some great verses there. So verse 19, eight says, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And that's exactly what the people did. They went away with great joy because they understand the words that had been given to them. And the teaching now was clear. Now, this was a pretty full first day, don't you think, for the Israelites? But then it says in verse 13, the second day they came back for more. They came back to be filled up and realign their lives with God's word again. And then in verses 14 and 15, it's here that we see the command that they found to live in booths or tabernacles during the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month. So look with me at verse 15b. The Feast of the Tabernacles instructed the people to do what? To go out into the hill country and to bring back branches of olives and wild olive trees and from myrtles and palms and shade trees. So they were making booths. And here's a picture of what one would maybe look like in the square. And then here's one on somebody's patio. Now, I've seen other pictures. This one's pretty fancy. I mean, they went to some trouble here. And I spoke to a friend of mine who used to live in Israel, and she was there during the Feast of Tabernacles, so she was able to witness exactly what's happening here when the people would set up booths. Most of them lived in apartments, so they would do this um, on their little patios, they would set up these booths. And she said that they ate most of their meals in the booth. And then e and each family had their own. And she said sometimes they would invite them to come down and have tea with them in their booth during this feast. So the Jews did what the word commanded. So they basically set up booths wherever they could. Uh, on rooftops, in courtyards, in courts of the house of God, and even by the water gate. So on the second day of the reading of the law, that they were reading, by the way, it was in Leviticus, they discovered these instructions to celebrate this feast of tabernacles. And another interesting thing, they had exactly two weeks to prepare for it because it started on the 15th of the month. Again, look at God's perfect timing. They had time to gather up everything they needed to celebrate this feast. And the feast begins five days after the Day of Atonement and at the time that the fall harvest had just been completed. So this was a time of joyous celebration as the Israelites celebrated God's provision for them in the current harvest as well as remembering back to how God provided and protected their ancestors when they were in the wilderness for 40 years. It was a time of remembrance and they needed to remember how powerfully God, um, losing my words, how powerfully God set their ancestors free from slavery and then how they lived as nomads in temporary shelters. So that's why they're building these booths or these tabernacles. So for 40 years, it tells us that their shoes never wore out and their feet didn't swell. I'd be celebrating if I found a pair of shoes that lasted for 40 years and my feet didn't swell. That'd be something to celebrate. But look beyond that because there's a lot of symbolism in this Feast of Tabernacles. Many scholars believe that it was during the feast that Jesus was born versus December when we celebrate it because we know from the Jewish calendar it was September, October-ish and shepherds are not abiding in the field in the winter when it's cold. John 1.14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the word dwell, dwelt here that John uses means dwelling among us. So it's the same word, it's tabernacle, to tabernacle among us. 
if I can turn my page here. So some believe John intentionally used this word to associate with the first coming of Christ with the Feast of Tabernacles. So Christ came in the flesh. He came to dwell or tabernacle among us for a temporary time. And then he's gonna come again to dwell as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now, we don't know for sure that Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles, but some scholars believe that's a very strong possibility because John is not only looking forward to his second coming, he's looking back. Look here at verse 17b. From the days of Joshua of son of Nun until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this and their joy was very great. It said that their celebration was unmatched since the days of Joshua. And how long ago was that? A thousand years. So these people way outdid everyone else. The people were never the same again. Yes, they sinned, but this left a mark on them. Verse 18 says, day after day, for seven days, Ezra read from the book of the law. They celebrated the feast for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly. And that's where we leave off. So we're kind of a cliffhanger here until we get to chapter 10 and we get to talk about this assembly. But what I want to close with today is some application for us, and this does come from Stephen Cole. He says that a strong emphasis on God's word is a primary mark of spiritual renewal. A strong emphasis on God's word is a primary mark of spiritual renewal. For spiritual renewal, God's people must read his word. God's people must reverently hear his word expounded upon. So God's word must be taught And then God's people must respond to the word of God. So we see, ladies, in these Israelites, they had five responses to God's word. They responded with repentance. They responded with joy. They responded with good deeds. We saw they took care of the poor. They responded with obedience. And they responded with worship. And that's my prayer for all of us, that we respond to God's word in the same way. And I thought about this, take the challenge with me. I wanna go back and I wanna write down one application that I can apply to my life for every chapter in the book of Nehemiah. I encourage you table leaders to encourage your groups to do it. And then on the last day, share. So if you have spent all these many weeks studying God's word, but you haven't applied it, what good does it do? Now I know you get nuggets here and there, but gosh, just invest that time in God's word so that you can see the fruit of that when you come to the end of Nehemiah. Let me pray for us as we go out. Lord God, um, Thank you for Teresa. Thank you for lining up the timing of her schedule with our Bible study. Thank you, Lord, for the way you orchestrate things throughout history and the way that we can see your hand in all things and the way the Israelites came to the seventh month, which was such a sacred month for them and the timing of all the things that took place prior to that. So, Lord, they could read your word and respond to your word, Lord. I pray for each of these ladies that they would find pockets of time, Lord, to sit at your feet and to be fed by your word and not only fed, Lord, but changed. In your precious name, amen.